welcome. I'm Ellen DeSaint Fowl, and uh, I'm eager to introduce our new speaker. But before I do, I wanted to just take a moment to thank our sponsor, People's United Bank, uh, whose generous support for the Books and Coffee program uh, has much appreciated. And here tonight is Stephanie Weston and Tani Sylvester. I also want to thank the friends in the audience. Your contribution to the Friends of Concordia makes all the difference. I'm thrilled to welcome Norb Vonnegut back to Bronxville. A graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Business School, Norb Vonnegut has written two financial thrillers. He also writes nonfiction material about financial matters for the Huffington Post, Switzer in Australia, and Acrimony. He's also appeared on Bloomberg News. A former banker, Norm built his wealth management career with Morgan Stanley, among other Wall Street institutions. Over the 20 plus years in banking, Norm must have encountered some real characters who provided fodder for the characters in his book. With apology to all the upstanding bankers in the audience, <laughs> his rich portrayal of greed, hubris, and scandalous behavior is frighteningly close to nonfiction. Critics hailed his first book, Top Producer, as the gold standard of financial thrillers. His second book continued critical acclaim, uh, praising it as another first-rate thriller. I would add that Norb Vonnegut's thrills linger long after you've closed the book. I know the next time I go to the movie theater in Bronxville, or take a swim at a certain pool in New York City, not to mention visiting the polar bears at the Bronx Zoo, I'll be thinking twice. And with that, please welcome Norb Vonnegut. Thanks, Ellen. Uh, wow, it's an honor to be here. It's great to be back in Bronxville. And uh, this, this room is special to me. I saw my daughter perform, my son perform here. So this is just great. Thank you for coming out in a wet night. So uh, I appreciate it. I thought what I would do is to speak a little bit about The Gods of Greenwich, which is the book that came out in April. I'll tell you a little bit about what it means to be an author. And then I'll tell you my favorite story about being an author. And, and from there, we can open it up for questions. And uh, I will the thing I want to say is Bill Clinton has this great line. He loves to get audience feedback because he says something along the lines that you may not like what I'm saying, but at least we'll be speaking about the things that are important to you. So please, please uh, throw out some questions at the end. So the, the gods of Greenwich. Uh, I start all of my books with a big idea. And the gods of Greenwich, the big idea is keeping up with the Joneses. How far would you go to keep up with the Joneses if you own a hedge fund and your life's ambition is to join the glitterati of money management. Now, think about that bar. That's a really high bar. Because when you look at hedge funds and what the folks make there, it's really serious money. Last year, the 25 highest paid hedge fund managers made, in aggregate, 20, $22 billion. All right, 22 billion. 25 guys brought home, in aggregate, $22 billion. I mean, that's, that's a lot of money. It's, it's, I have no idea what that means. In fact, uh, the, best, the best thing I can say is, is that GE, during 2010, made $11 billion. So 25 guys made double what 300,000 people generate in one company. So keeping up with the Joneses is an interesting thought. But this idea of what does it take in this world is really interesting to me. And I start The Gods of Greenwich with a woman who is not from that world. She's a nurse. Her name is Rachel Whittier. If you haven't read the book, uh, when you meet her, I think you'll care about it. I think that you'll think Rachel is adorable. Uh, she is cute. She is smart. She has a Texas twang and uses the greatest tex Texas expressions. And I'll tell you personally that I think Texas is God's gift to the English language. 
I'm, there, I mean, some of the expression, I'm, I'm as happy as a dog with two tails tonight. I mean, isn't that great? I mean, where, where but Texas? I, I have a blast uh, hearing what they have to say. So you'll like Rachel, and you'd think, as I said, that she's adorable, except for one thing. And she runs around the book whacking 70-year-olds. I mean, otherwise, she's, she's very charming. And she kills 70-year-olds, and she does it through the book, and she's a constant menace. And you wonder, what does this woman have to do with a hedge fund in Greenwich and a bank in Iceland? So I tell the story, and I un unveil it through the eyes of Jimmy Cusack. And here's where I dig digress. People always ask me, well, where do you get the names of, of people in your books and everything? So let me tell you about the real Jimmy Cusack. The real Jimmy Cusack was my grandfather. And, uh, you know, he had a, uh, a checkered career. He uh, immigrated from Ireland, grew up in Chicago, and when my mother was very young, he started throwing dice one evening, and he threw dice for a cigar store. He went all in, and he lost the store. And so I'm thinking, what, I, I, th I had two thoughts about that. I think, you know, number one, what did he tell my grandmother when he came home that night about losing the store? So that, that's number one. But the other thing is, when I think about hedge funds, they really roll the bone. They go in big time. They make big bets. They can't make 22, 25 guys can't make $22 billion without taking on a lot of risk. And so I thought Jimmy Cusack is a great name for my hero. So I digress, and that's, that's where the name comes from. So in any event, Cusack has a story that we, all, we can all relate to. Um, he loses his job. He falls three months behind on his mortgage. Times are tough. It's 2008. The market hasn't crashed, but it's on its way. And everybody in finance has a sense it's a tough time. And Cusack uh, the, learns the day that, that he learns his wife is two months pregnant, pregnant, the day that the bank forecloses on him. So he's got a tough, tough road, road to help. But he, he thinks life is getting better because he takes a job with this hedge fund in Greenwich. And he doesn't know a lot about the hedge fund, but he knows that they've never lost money, that the owner of the hedge fund is an emerging superstar in the field, and uh, Jimmy Cusack thinks that his ship has come in, but in fact, he has stepped into the Bermuda Triangle of Finance. Because all is not as it seems with the hedge fund, and this bank in Iceland is really nasty, and his hedge fund, his employers, crossed this bank, and so there's a little bit of a war. And meanwhile, there's this nurse that I told you about, and what's she doing? How is she related to these people? And why is she running around killing people in their 70s? So I tell this story through Jimmy Cusack. And hopefully you have some fun seeing what I think about the Bronxville movie theaters <laughs> and as you go through. Um, so as an author, it's a brand new career for me, brand new. I spent 20 years uh, in finance, 15 in, in wealth management. And so uh, what I really love about being an author is that I get to relax and take my time and appreciate the things that we take for granted every single day of our lives. Um, let's talk about trash cans. All right, so Bronxville is a pretty nice place. It's an affluent place. And on the weekends, every once in a while, you'll see that our trash cans f overflow in the, here in town. And it, you know, they get cleaned up, but it happens. So I used to go every every day and every night to Greenwich. And I would sit down on the park benches and I would look at the people go by and I'd try to get a feel for how, uh, what, what life was like. And I got really obsessive about the day to day, even to the point where I would look at the trash cans in Greenwich and they look like these double wide mailboxes. They're the perfect hunter green and there is never any trash coming out of these trash cans, ever. I mean, and so I'm looking at this trash can behind it, behind it 
is this light post. And it's this big black light post. And I'm looking at the trash can, the light post, and I'm thinking that this light post is like an exclamation point to everything perfect in Greenwich. And so if you pick up the book, you'll see how I feel about Greenwich. It's a really nice place. And I, I ran around the city and I toured all kinds of uh, places. Um, you would not believe what bartenders in Greenwich will tell you at 11 o'clock on a Wednesday night. I mean, everybody else is going home and I'm the only guy in the bar. And the stories that you get are phenomenal. And the things that you overhear are phenomenal. And they make a difference to the professional critics. So uh, it, the New York Times has mentioned the gods of Greenwich three times this, this year. And the writers all picked up on the things that I plucked out of Greenwich. So Kevin Roos, who writes for Deal Book, said something I could totally imagine being said in Greenwich. This rosé is all the rage in St. Barth. He pulled that out of my book. He said, yeah, that rings true. Well, Kevin, I actually heard that in a bar in Greenwich. I mean, it's, you know, you develop an ear and you start to appreciate the way people talk, the way they walk, what have you. Um, let's see, Janet Maslin, uh, when she included the gods of Greenwich in her must-read beach books for 2011, one of the things that she picked up on is I talked about a colorist who went to a private home under the cover of night. Now, I'm hanging around Greenwich, I'm sitting on this, this park bench and watching people go by, and the thing that appears to me while I'm sitting there, all right, sitting like this, everybody looks blonde. It's crazy. Everybody looks blonde. Even if they aren't, everybody looks blonde. And I just got obsessive about these details. And so I'm talking to this bartender, and he says, let me tell you what happens. There's this guy, and he uh, comes in here all the time. He's telling me how he works in the hedge fund industry, and he has a colorist come to his house at night to dye his daughter's hair blonde because they're, they're sort of a brown-black naturally, and the girls are three and four years old. Now, so, you know, three and four-year-old girls are beautiful. I, you know, they don't, who needs to do that? But I thought it was a great thing to put in the book as social commentary about this environment. Uh, here's, a, here's another one, another example of something I saw. All right, so if anybody knows the answer to this, I am really impressed. I want a show of hands. Uh, do you know what the lineage is of Pegasus, the, the winged horse in Greek mythology? Does anybody know who the mother is, who the father is? Um, why do we care, right? <laughs> why do we care? So uh, the story on Pegasus is I went to an office building where all the hedge funds are, where many hedge funds are, and it's called a hedge fund hotel. And in the lobby of this hedge fund hotel is, is the sculpture of these wings. There are these two disembodied wings. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. I, I don't know if it's good art or not, but it caught my attention. I went over and I took a look because I'm an author now and I have time to enjoy the details about life every day. So I took a look and I saw it's Pegasus. All right, so immediately I realized I'd forgotten all my Greek mythology from uh, when I was a kid. And I, I did what we all do is I went right to Wikipedia and I looked up Pegasus. And so Pegasus, the, Pegasus' father is Poseidon, the god of everything underwater. And Pegasus' mother is the Medusa, you know, the snakes and everything. And I thought, wow. You know, how did that happen, number one? You know, how did the Greeks come up with that? But I thought it would be extremely clever to make an observation about that while, while I was talking about the, uh, the hedge fund industry. So if you pick up the book, you'll see I talk a little bit about Pegasus and make some snarky comment about, well, you know, the god of everything underwater during 2008, it seems like it's only appropriate. Um, you know, I love the details, uh, they're fun. And uh, I'd also say when you walk around Bronxville and you take a little time 
to enjoy the city and check it out. Just, you know, check it out, enjoy it. I mean, it's, uh, you don't have to be an author to do it. So that's been a big change for me because usually it's about securities. Uh, or it used to be about securities because I was in money management and I asked as a money manager the same question I ask as an author. As a money manager, I said, what can go wrong? And I tried to protect my clients' portfolios from that. As an author, I ask, what can go wrong? And I try to push people into the pit of what can go wrong and throw a life rope and you know, pull them out at the end but if somebody says, well, I'm really glad this is a novel, then mission accomplished. I feel pretty good about that. Um, in some ways, having worked on Wall Street was the best training in the world to be an author. Okay? It was just tremendous because I had exposure to real cast of characters. Uh, Richard mentioned when we were speaking earlier today, there was a sentencing of a big hedge fund fellow Raj, I, I don't know his last, I can't say his last name, uh, but you know, he got 11, 12 years, whatever. It, you saw a lot of bigger than life personalities. Uh, I never met him personally, but the stories that came out of his shop were just horrific, uh, you know, even while I was in the industry. So I had exposure to lots of personality types that, that find their way in behavior into the books, in, into my books I write. Uh, when you look at the gods of Greenwich and you meet the character named Victor Lee, just remember that the supplements that he takes, I actually read a real court case about that. So I'll leave it at that and just, it's intriguing, I'm, and I'll leave that one there. Um, the flip side of all this great exposure is that working on Wall Street is the worst training in the world for what, it, um, what, it, what you're required to do as an author. Uh, being an author is about writing, and it's about telling the best stories you can, but it's also a business. All right? You have to work really hard to get out and, and market books. It's um, no different than any other business. You work hard, and you, you're always going at it. Um, if any, it's, the, being an author is not a field of dreams experience. You know, build it, they will come, write it, they will read it, uh-uh. You have to get out and tell your story. And it's great fun, um, however, you have to talk to the press. And for years, you, Patty, you'll have to hear this story again. So for years, years, I was always told while I worked uh, on Wall Street, do not talk to the press. If you talk to the press, you will be fired. We won't wait, it's shoot first, ask questions later. And I think that there's a fair, that's reasonable because uh, things can be taken out of context, but it's if you want to sell your books as an author, you have to talk to the press. I mean, talking to the folks at New York Times was the best thing that ever happened to me. So I had no skills to deal with this. And um, now that I'm on to my third book, what I realize is that every book brings with it a signature event, a signature story. And I don't mean what occurs in the books, what occurs to me while I'm writing, while I'm researching, while I'm, I'm marketing. So my first book, Top Producer, my signature event took place in Australia. And I was invited out to the Brisbane Writers' Festival. Um, this is while we lived in Bronxville. And I was thrilled. I can't, I was ecstatic over the top because uh, my wife and I lived in Australia for three years, uh, years ago, at the start of our careers. So um, we went out to Australia and we saw all of our friends and we had these big nights. But my big moment in the sun was in Brisbane where my novel was coming out a week in advance of it showing in in New York, and the reason is I have a different publisher in Australia than I do in New York. So my Australian publisher uh, brought it out the beginning of September of 2009, and I was thrilled. This was like a big deal. And all of a sudden, I was thrust into this situation where uh, one day I talked on three separate radio shows. I 
also I was on panels, I met somebody at a TV station, all these folks on the, from the press. And I was loving it. I had a blast. And I'm thinking, these are not evil people. I will not go to hell for, for speaking with them. I mean, this was great, great fun. So, so there I was. Um, I'm having this great time. And I have to confess that it sort of went to my head a little bit. And I'm thinking, oh my god, I'm famous. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> this is wonderful. So um, that night, um, that night, my wife and I had a big night out, OK? And I just knew that I would sleep through a press interview at 2 in the morning. Now, what, what's the 2 in the morning interview? Well, remember, I'm in Australia. And my book, Top Producer, is coming out in the States the week after. And the, my publicist, which is kind of cool. You know, I was thinking, this is cool. I have a publicist in Australia. I have one in the United States. My US publicist uh, set up an interview at 2 in the morning. And it was with Buddy Sianci's radio show in Providence, Rhode Island. And he has a big following there. Great stuff. But I just knew I would sleep through this event. I just knew it. So what happened? I talked to the folks at the reception. I said, call me at 1 AM. I set the alarm clock next to our bed to 1 AM. And I uh, set my Blackberry at the time to 1 AM. And so the alarms all went off at 1 AM. It sounded like there's a five alarm fire down the street. But I got up. I got up, and I had an hour to get ready for this interview at 2 in the morning. So the first thing that I noticed is I was a mess. I was absolutely a mess. I had this bed head. Um, I had on this pair of pajamas from last century, literally from the last century. And I looked like hell. I needed to get out of the room. My wife's late, and Mary's, uh, yeah, you know. So I had, I had to get out to wake up. So I threw on some shorts. I left on these, these PJ tops from, from last year, or from last century. And here's, here's where I need a prop. I'm not checking my emails while I'm speaking. But I walked downstairs, and there was a bench in front of the hotel. And the, a good way to wake up is in the middle of the night is to read your emails, because it sort of juices you, and you get uh, agitated about things that keep us agitated, whatever. So I'm, re I'm looking at my emails like this. And there's a woman across the street with two guys in tow. And these three have clearly had a big night, a really big night. And I'm thinking, oh, uh, wow, fun. And she points at me. And I'm thinking, oh, no. She's going to ask me to sign an autograph because I'm now the world famous Norb Vonnegut who's come out with this first book. And I just, I, the last, look, the last way that I wanted to be remembered out in Australia was with bedhead, this nasty old shirt on, and, and uh, shorts, reading, reading my emails. I, I really just wanted to hide. But she was relentless. She's pointing at me, and they're coming closer and closer. And I'm reading my emails. I'm just like wicked buried in them. And I'm, I'm going through one after another, really trying to show that I'm intent on, on working. She comes up and she says, look, he's homeless. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so uh, what did I do? I, I looked over my shoulder. <laughs> uh, nobody behind me. And she was relentless. She said, do you think he needs money? And, and the guys are like scratching their heads and, well, maybe. And, and so there I am sitting down, and I must have looked like the deer that you see on, on, the, on the merit. You know, I must have, like a deer in the headlights. Because I'm looking, I'm shaking my head, my hands are rising like this. And she says, no, it's OK. He has a Blackberry. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, that was my signature event for Top Producer. And, uh, you, you know, since that time, I've gotten a little or more moderate in my expectations and what it means to talk to the press. Uh, I've had a blast talking to the press, and it just gets better and better. So with that, let me open it up for some questions and, uh, you know, tell some stories and have some fun. Yes, sir. Story you already 
written in your mind? Uh, so, so the question is, how much of the story do I have written in my mind before I start writing? Uh, it, it, it's a timeless question. Do you outline beforehand? And the short answer is yes, I, I do. And what, what I have in my head are the beginning of the book and the end of the book. I have both, both really clear in my head. I know exactly what's going to happen. And in between, I, I don't have a, a piece of paper, but I, I do the financing, I draw a chart, and I would draw um, sort of peaks like this, three separate peaks uh, connecting the beginning and the end. And the reason, the reason I would do that is because I know that to keep the, the uh, reader's attention, I have to increase the stakes as I go along because nobody's obligated to, to read a book. Nobody's obligated to finish and nobody reads to get to the middle. So I'm trying to ratchet up in the middle of the book, the tension as I go along, and that tension is, it's not always there. Uh, you, you'll see some, some authors will come in, they'll say, yeah, well, I know everything uh, ahead of time. I spend eight months, eight months trying to figure out the story, and I know it, and it's just a month to write it. And I don't, I don't really do that personally because I don't think creativity comes with an on-off switch. Uh, you know, you sit down and you hear things, and sometimes, sometimes you'll hear just dialogue from people, and it's great dialogue. And it, you have to go back and put it in because it's just so good. How do you record that dialogue? Do you take notes? Do you have a tape recorder? Do you go home and make notes? Or I mean, if you're sitting in a bar, apparently, I, I would assume you'd not be making notes. No, not in a bar. I mean, uh, that scares everybody off. And the, the th you know, it's, it's not like, I mean, first of all, it's fiction. So I'm not taking liberties with, with anything I, I hear. Um, the second thing, though, is, is that I, I tend to remember it. I have a, a really great capacity to remember stories. I always have. And when I was a, in wealth management, the way I built my business was by telling stories to people. And I just remember tons and tons of stories. And I, I tend to remember dialogue. And so I, it's not hard. But what I'll typically do, or what I would do after, um, after the nights in Greenwich, I would go home and I would write down right away, because I know in the next morning I might forget it. And so I, I, I always write it down. Um, okay, so what's the favorite part of the writing process? What's the least favorite part? I have to tell you that right now it's the research. Okay, so in the last month, I'm, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the third book I'm, I'm writing now, which will be out next summer. It's called The Trust. And in the last month, I have spoken with a fellow, and spent a lot of time with a fellow, who ran drugs for a living on those fast boats down in Florida. I spoke to a fellow who is in charge of preventing money laundering in the Turks and Caicos. I've spoken in the last uh, couple of weeks to a fellow who spent two years in jail for options irregularities. And I think it's fascinating. Um, it's really interesting to be around these, these folks and to learn about their lives and to get in close and personal with them. And again, back, back to my word before, to obsess on the, the details. I love that portion and it adds to the fiction, makes it so much better. And when I do the research like that, the, the reviewers always pull it out. They always cite those examples because so much of what happens in finance you just can't make up. It's really interesting. So. Um, I, as an aside, if you want to go to the Turks and Caicos off the immigration grid and you don't want to go through customs or anything, I'm your guy. <laughs> I can tell you how to do it. My, in my next book, it's all there. It's all laid out. You want to do it? You want to get there without, without the hassle of the long lines?
I know how to do it. Um, so I love that part. As far as the, um, yeah, look, you, you know, as far as the hardest part is if, if you think that writing is uh, easy, I, I, I mean, I know you're writing, and I, I don't think it's easy at all. I sit down every morning at 8 o'clock. I'm really disciplined. I basically flog myself until I get 1,000 words on the page that day. It's really hard uh, because my, my feeling is, is if somebody is kind enough to purchase a book, you have to give them a treat every single page. Uh, because, like I say, nobody has to, nobody is obligated to read to the end of a book. And so to be consistently dense, uh, if you will, that's probably not a good thing in some ways, <laughs> but to be dense in your writing, uh, and I'm, I'm using that word on purpose, I, I think that uh, you really have to sweat and labor over it. Um, and back to the question before, sometimes, sometimes, you find something out, you think of something down the road that makes me want to go back and change a passage that I finished two months ago or two weeks ago, whatever. So that's the hardest, that's the, the easiest. Uh, some of the, uh, let me tell you a little bit about my third book because uh, there's one, one area that I think is, is a lot of fun and it's fictionalizing real life stories. So uh, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, a book that I'm writing called The, the Trust. Uh, who here is Catholic? Me too, okay. So don't be annoyed with me uh, because it all works out well for the Catholics. <laughs> um, I got dispensation from the family priest. Uh, you know, he's, he's okay with it. He married me, he can take it back. I don't want that to happen. <laughs> So, um, who's driven, all right, so now that we're in question and answer, who's driven through North Carolina on I-95? Okay, so you know the road. The road is long, it unravels to the horizon, and it would be really easy to fall asleep in the heat, save two things. You know, the, the bugs that hit the windshields, they kind of explode, and they make these yellow cone-shaped splats. I mean, you, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, so. With the, you get those yellow splats that keep you awake, and also the billboards. Okay, so again, one of the new things that I do as an author is I start exploring details. And I always thought the billboards were painted. Well, they used to be painted, but now about 90% of the billboards that go up uh, are put up in tarps. And there are five people that are required to put together billboards. So you've got three guys to pull these tarps up from the top and two guys to feed them up uh, because the tarps are really heavy. So uh, there's a fellow who's driving down I-95 and he looks up at a billboard before he goes home and he sa the billboard says HIP 20,000 square feet opening next week. And he thinks, oh great, you know what kind of store is HIP? Now, He's about to go home, and this is, his home is just off exit 55 in North Carolina. And the thing about exit 55, I know from my research, is that the zip code there has a total of 57 different churches. And of those 57 churches, 24 of them are Baptist churches. So he's going home into a Bible Belt community, and I, I had to explore this because when I think of North Carolina, I don't think of it as a Bible Belt community. So he goes home, and he, uh, uh, or he's driving along on his way home, and the billboard keeps going up. In the middle of the billboard, you see it sees a woman's head about to eat a chocolate-covered strawberry, and this woman looks very much like Angelina Jolie. What kind of story is this? And so at the bottom, at the bottom of this uh, tarp is uh, an explanation. HIP is Highly Intimate Pleasures. It's an adult superstore that's opening up in the backyard of all these Baptists in the subdivision. <laughs> all right, so as you, I mean, you, this would be like the worst thing in the world that could happen, right? So you can imagine, you can imagine just how horrid that would be to the community, and sure enough, the community hires a lawyer in my fiction, and the lawyer's name is Biscuit Hughes. 
Biscuit. That's a good southern name. So, so Biscuit, uh, it's a Sunday afternoon. There's an emergency session of a subdivision. And Biscuit stands in front of this crowd. And you can imagine, it's really emotionally charged. It's really scary. And so, so um, the, folks, uh, the folks say to Biscuit, uh, what are you going to do about this store that's opening up next week? And Biscuit has quite a reputation in North Carolina because he's won a big lawsuit against a, a foreign developer that came into the state. By foreign, I mean California-based. <laughs> <laughs> so so he said, he, he, Biscuit's worried. And he says, well, I don't know if we can do that much. Well, would you, and the, the community presses him. Well, what did you do last time? He said, well, what I usually do is I go and I find bad stuff on the owners of the, the offending development. And then we stop them in zoning because that's what good old boys do. Okay, now I grew up in South Carolina. I can assure you this is what good old boys do, is, is you play it out in the zoning and you say as many bad things as you can about the owners. And they, and they said, well, what's so hard about finding bad stuff about the owners? Everybody has secrets. Well, this isn't just any owner. It's a foundation. Oh, what kind of foundation? Uh, well, this, this foundation, uh, he, and he's sort of hems and haws, they're located in D.C. And the crowd tells him, Ans answer the question. He says the foundation is a Catholic fund. And what are they doing owning an adult superstore outside of Fayetteville, North Carolina, in the backyard of this Baptist-dominated subdivision? So that's the story I tell. And yeah, I mean, if, if there's not a punchline yet, I just want you to be sucked in so next summer, <laughs> I mean, there, there's a commercial element to this. So, um, what might be interesting to you is where the fiction originated. I'll tell you a real story that's a little different and with some of the issues I won't deal with. Uh, so there was, this is, now this is true, all right? So there's a kid riding a bicycle outside his subdivision, uh, or in his subdivision outside Atlanta, Georgia. And he saw all these, these posters on trees that said zoning, zoning, zoning. And he grabbed one of the posters off and he brought it home. And he said, Mom, Dad, what's this about? And they explained to him what zoning means and what the changes are. And it, they explained to him that next to the subdivision was a chicken processing plant. And that's why it smells so bad. Because when the wind blows just right, uh, the, pro the, the smell of processing chickens is terrible. Okay, so, uh, the, the, you know, they, the community is up in arms because the processing plant wants to expand and to process more, more chickens. So they hire a lawyer. And the lawyer starts looking around, but he can't find anything out about the owners. And he starts to find stuff about the owners. He finds that it's a foundation based in Reston, Virginia. And, and so he checks in into that. And um, all of a sudden, the FBI comes knocking at his door. And they, they say to the lawyer, cease and desist. We don't want you exploring who the owners are of this chicken processing plant. So he said, get lost. I have to take care of my clients. So uh, he keeps moving along, and he finds it's a foundation, as I said, in, in Reston that owns the uh, processing plant. He goes to the foundation's address in, in Reston, and it's a see-through shell. There's nothing there. And he finds that there's cross holdings with another foundation out in, in um, uh, the Cayman Islands. He flies out to the Cayman Islands and there's nothing there. And so finally, he puts it all together. And he, get, he enlists some help from a friend of his who's a reporter at NPR. So, there's, so the zoning meeting comes up for the expansion of this chicken plant. And this reporter stands up in the middle of the meeting and he says, my name is John Smith. I am a reporter with NPR. 
So you could hear a pin drop in this, in this room. He said, did you know that the owners of this chicken ranch are Islamic foundations with ties to Al-Qaeda? And I can prove it. All right, the place explodes. I mean, you, you, I'm thinking in my neighborhood, the good old boys would have run out, grabbed the shotguns out of the back of the truck and shot somebody. I mean, it was really a highly, highly charged meeting. So I have no interest in telling that story on a nonfiction basis or speaking about the Islamic community. I think it's too easy for authors to uh, write thrillers about them. I, I don't know much about the community. If I know a lot about being Catholic, I know a lot about uh, what would upset me as a homeowner. And I have to tell you, if a, if a superstore that, had, that named highly intimate pleasures moved in down the street from where we used to live on Bronxville, uh, I mean, I'd go ballistic. And so that's sort of how I've converted a real life story into fiction. And I'll tell you the end of the real life story uh, about this. You can find all this on the web. If you have, ask me afterwards, I can give you the name of the plant, but I, I don't want to bring problems to anybody. But the real life story is that the next day after this zoning meeting, the FBI raided some 27 different uh, uh, Islamic foundations across the country, and those raids gave rise to the Million Muslim March that we remember from what I, I guess it was eight, eight, nine years ago. Um, so, I, you know, we, I find inspiration in everything. Thank okay. You so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I invite you all out to the reception, and I'd like to remind you on December 15th, Ellen Feldman will be here to discuss her book, Next to Love. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.